All right, let's take a look at chapter 18, uh, which is called Activity-Based Costing, and we have some learning objectives here that we probably should uh, go over. You know, we've, uh, so far in the semester, at least the part that's uh, related to managerial accounting, we've been dealing with what is referred to as traditional costing. And so we're gonna distinguish between traditional costing and activity-based costing uh, in this chapter. Some of the uh, things that we'll look at in the handout really, quite honestly, should be a review. Um, but we're going to go over some of the uh, regular traditional costing uh, methods that we've looked at, uh, basically to help us distinguish between the two. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, identify the steps in development of an activity-based costing system and uh, probably one of the very first things that we need to do is um, is understand you know as we go through this if we look at this third item here it says know how companies identify activity cost pools used in activity-based uh, costing and if we can if we can do that and we can understand this fourth item know how companies identify and use cost drivers in activity based costing well then we can probably do this second step here so we don't know yet what an activity cost pool actually is but we're about to find out and we actually do know um, what cost drivers are now we might have uh, word referred to them in the past as activity levels or something like that, but they're cost drivers. So if we think about our, um, you know, our, our typical uh, formula for predetermined overhead, and we have our manufacturing overhead by some type of activity level as the uh, denominator, well, that that activity level is a cost driver. And so we're actually more familiar with this than maybe what we think. And then finally, uh, there are some be both benefits uh, to activity-based costing, otherwise we wouldn't do it. Uh, but there are also some limitations as well. So, um, you know, we know when we talk about product cost that we're dealing with three things. We're dealing with direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. So determining the proper amount of overhead to assign each product, service, job, whatever the case may be, this is the most difficult part because factory overhead is applied using uh, an allocation method. With both direct materials and direct labor, of course, we're able to use uh, you know, actual figures. We don't do that, however, uh, with factory overhead. We use an estimate of uh, total overhead and some type of activity driver or drivers uh, to determine the amount of overhead to apply. And then we reconcile any differences at the end of the period. So factory overhead is by its very nature going to be more difficult uh, to assign uh, accurately to products, product costs. Okay, so with traditional costing, uh, and quite honestly, any type of costing, we have some, some goals here. It says um, we want to allocate as fairly as possible the true costs of the products. If we don't get this part right, uh, we're going to have a, a large reconciliation that can become quite complicated at the end of the period. Um, Truer words have never been spoken. Uh, when we have accurate costs, better decisions can be made. You know, basically, we don't want to underprice or overprice our product because of inaccurate factory overhead application. It says here that direct materials and direct labor costs are easiest to trace through through what material requisitions for materials and payroll timesheets. That's because both uh, direct materials and direct labor costs are prime costs. 
P-R-I-M-E, okay? So they're a little bit easier. Traditional costing, uh, you know, it says allocates overhead using a single predetermined rate. This is technically true. Uh, that single predetermined rate can be for an entire plant or uh, as we've also looked at this semester, uh, can also be uh, done at the departmental level. You know, we have two couple of departments with two different cost drivers. You know, we're still we're still using one uh, predetermined rate per department, but they could be different drivers. We might have uh, direct labor hours in one department and machine hours in another department, but we're still using one. Uh, single predetermined overhead rate. Oftentimes, with this is not completely true, um, but with job order costing, direct labor is often a a large proportion uh, or a large cost driver for our factory overhead due to the specialized nature, um, and that's fine, you know, so long as that holds true. If it, you know, if we have a situation where we're using um, either direct labor cost or direct labor hours, and we end up with some bizarre figure, you know, we're we're never going to match uh, direct labor cost, uh, you know, cleanly to factory overhead, but we, you know, we shouldn't have a situation where we, for example, uh, are paying our employees $20 an hour for direct labor and our direct, you know, our predetermined rate is $1,000 per direct labor hour. When something like that happens, that's a dead giveaway that we need to be using activity-based costing because we have a large amount of overhead and not enough and, and basically direct labor hours are not a large enough uh, driver, okay? Also, when it comes to process costing, process costing a little more mechanized than job order costing. Uh, the slide says that machine hours is assumed to be the relevant activity base. And again, uh, that's not always true, um, but it's a little bit more true with process costing than with uh, job order costing, but we, you know, we know that we can have a uh, a job order system, or at least a department and a job order system, uh, where machine hours is a relevant activity base, uh, or we could have a, you know, a department in process costing where uh, direct labor hours or even direct labor cost potentially is the relevant activity base. So when there is a large amount of um, machine hours being used. If we're using machine hours as our activity base, that's fine. Um, but that's not always the case. And if, and if it's not the case, if we're using machine hours and it is not the predominant driver of cost, then we're going to, we're going to apply factory overhead inaccurately. And we're going to have a product that is either, uh, overpriced or underpriced as a result. So there's been a lot of change in manufacturing and service industries uh, over the years. Uh, many different trends have arisen. Uh, and one of those I've somewhat alluded to already is that a decrease in the amount of direct labor usage. Most industries have become more automated okay and so even in industries that have been historically dominated by high direct labor costs uh, that trend is is going is is going in one direction and that is that direct labor is used less and less however um, at the same time while direct labor uh, usage and costs have gone down. Overall overhead costs have gone up, which has 
weaken the link even further between using direct labor hours as a single plant-wide uh, factory overhead cost driver, at least an accurate one. It says it may be inappropriate to use a plant-wide predetermined overhead rate based on direct labor or machine hours when a lack of correlation exists. Well, it's not that it may be inappropriate, it is going to be uh, inappropriate. Now, again, if if we can, sometimes we can go department to department and we can say, hey, you know what, we're going to use direct labor in department A and machine hours in department B. And we can be close enough with our cost allocation that we can still use, um, you know, departmental rates, a single rate per department. But as manufacturing processes become more and more complex, you know, it's possible that that even something that has been as predominant as direct labor or machine hours is simply no longer uh, enough. So we have to uh, embrace uh, something else. And it says that complex manufacturing processes may require multiple. And in this case, really, we're talking more than two. I mean, I realize multiple is more than one but multiple allocation bases, and we call this activity-based costing, and that's the name of the chapter, so that makes sense. Uh, so let's see here, what do we have? So in activity-based costing, it says that it is an allocation system whereby we are allocating overhead to activity cost pools. Okay, so just like a swimming pool accumulates water, these cost pools accumulate costs. Okay, and they do that by way of drivers. Drivers, a cost driver is something that drives a cost upwards. Okay, so an activity is any event, transaction, work sequence, whatever. Uh, that where we're having a cost incurred in the product of uh, uh, the uh, producing of a product. And they give us a couple of examples here. Um, something that we haven't seen before. And this is just a couple of examples. Purchasing materials is one of those. It costs money to purchase materials. Uh, setting up machines is another example. So I want you to understand that we could have a situation where one company says, okay, um, I have, you know, we, we run through, you know, every time we have a purchase order, there's a cost attached to that. And we have 20,000 of these suckers every year. So purchasing materials is a big deal for that company. Lots of purchase requisitions being filled out. However, another company may say, well, you know, we, we have about a hundred purchase orders a year purchasing materials, purchase requisitions, orders of uh, goods, not uh, much of an activity, therefore that would not be an appropriate activity cost pool. Same thing with setting up machines. Some companies have to set up machines in process costing or, or some type of batch uh, processing, but not all companies have this. And then the cost drivers are any factors or activities that have a direct cause effect relationship with the resources consumed. So purchasing materials, we have to have a purchase order. Setting up machines, we have to actually set up. So the number of setups and so forth. Okay, so uh, it says ABC allocates costs in two stages. Step one is overhead costs are allocated to activity pools. And step two, the overhead costs allocated to the cost pools are assigned to uh, products using cost drivers. Now, this is the exact same thing that we've done in the past. So if that sounds a bit vague or perhaps a bit familiar, um, there's, there's a reason for that. The only difference here is, is this language here about activity cost pools. So let's do this. Let's see here. Uh, okay. Very good. The more complex a product's manufacturing operation, the more activities and cost drivers are likely to be present. So we can have, instead of having one 
uh, factory overhead rate, we can have 10 or 12, depending on a company's uh, level of complexity. And how many different uh, activities are driving costs. All right, so let's, um, let's go ahead and wrap this video up and we're gonna come back and start another video and we're gonna start on this slide right here, but this video is already getting a bit long, so we're gonna end it now and get another one started forthwith.